All right, all right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's September 9th, 2020. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator. That means we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team and then showing you the ropes. If that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com dot com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. Uh, we host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to the Office Hours channel, as well as follow up with an email so that you can share with your team. With that said, let's kick things off. So don't have too many uh, exciting announcements today. The major one is if you're using uh, the Cloud Posse Terraform modules for EKS, uh, you'll probably enjoy the latest updates to our managed node group module. So let me uh, open that up uh, in U tab. So the, uh, the EKS node group module has been updated to support the latest changes to support um, the cloud init and user data stuff. So you can now have a script uh, uh, for the user data after joining the cluster. Uh, we also support the taints. So you can uh, automatically add the taints for your nodes uh, before they join. This is really useful for uh, like uh, spinning up additional node pools with GPUs and things like that. We also support um, the labels, uh, Kubernetes labels automatically now. And the last really nice thing is uh, create before destroy. So. Uh, we added backwards compatibility for those uh, who don't want this disruptive uh, destructive change. But if you do enable this, it will create your node pools now uh, as pet sets. Um, and it has, uh, what do you call it, keepers that operate on the Kubernetes version, on the, uh, on the user data scripts, on the other things there. So when those keepers change, it will create new pets uh, in the set and uh, create uh, those new node pools. The beautiful thing about this is it's, uh, you know, they're create before destroy. So it will create the new node groups, um, move everything over to it uh, uh, before destroying the old ones. And as we have observed, uh, the EKS managed node groups uh, do properly um, drain the, uh, the uh, old pools uh, before terminating them. So it's mostly graceful, uh, assuming that your pod um, disruption budgets and your pod general pod settings, like whether you're using EBS or not, are all set correctly. So that's, uh, that's the latest on the EKS stuff. Any questions on our uh, support for EKS node groups? All right, uh, moving on then. Um, the the next thing, these are two things that were brought up uh, in the Sweet Ops Slack that I thought were pretty cool. Um, one was uh, a version checker you can deploy um, in your cluster. Now this is by Jetstack, uh, the same uh, makers of Cert Manager, uh, so they have a pretty cool track record. What's cool about this is they provide a Grafana dashboard once you deploy this, so you can keep track of um, all your images in the cluster and what your current version is and if there's a newer version available and uh, you can sort by whether it's the latest or not. So it's just a nice uh, housekeeping uh, utility you can deploy to your cluster. The other related thing that was kind of cool was um, a, a, a product by Fairwinds so Fairwinds um, has a lot of nice little things for Kubernetes, like um, I forget what the uh, Astro. Astro is like their operator for managing Datadog uh, alerts. Um, they have uh, Nova, 
which is uh, similar to the other one, but it's more Cly driven and it lets you uh, I discover uh, the charts installed and if uh, they're the latest uh, one or also really important, are they deprecated? There's a lot of chart deprecation happening now, so uh, this is not a bad thing to have a look at. Reason for the chart deprecation is of course because uh, the official Helm chart repo Helm charts is um, you know going end of life. Uh, let's see what the latest is here. So uh, one year support will formally end uh, in November of this year. So if you're depending on any charts that are hosted here, you're going to want to find an alternative. Uh, we're finding a lot of our alternatives in Bitnami. Uh, so check out Bitnami charts if uh, you're looking for something. Unfortunately, a lot of them are not drop-in replacements and the interface changes like the, uh, the Helm values change for a lot of Bitnami charts. So keep that in mind. So uh, that's the, the how to easily monitor Helm charts and versions. Um, the last one is just a, an announcement because it's something we ran into. I'm sure everyone is running into their own uh, issues every single day, but we, uh, we use a lot of GitHub Actions and GitHub Actions uh, are awesome for little drop-in things like building Docker images, right? Well, turns out the quote-unquote stable uh, build and push action, uh, which was at version uh, one, uh, stopped working at version one and they ripped out the support for login support from the Docker action. So I guess what this points out, if anything, which is something like there, there's kind of like a uh, professional social contract that when you're tagging something at like V1 or V2, that that interface shouldn't change dra radically like that. And you shouldn't deprecate capabilities like login or tagging. And that's what happened with this GitHub action from Docker. So. They, uh, they did that. So anyways, we, we had to fix it by upgrading to the V2 version, which is still not uh, generally available per their advice. And what they've done is they've split out. You have to do your own uh, tag generation now, and you have to uh, do your own login uh, explicitly because this makes it more interoperable with all the other uh, registries out there. And they probably got tired about everybody asking, hey, can you implement this other tagging scheme that we need? So just do tagging yourself. If, um, if you're using GitHub Actions, one thing that's really nice in GitHub Actions is you can emit this um, well-formed value that looks something like this uh, to pass variables or settings between your steps. And then if you name your steps, something like this, if you give them an ID, you can then reference those down the road. So that's really convenient. Uh, all right, any questions about uh, the Docker GitHub action? So the end result of that is something that looks like this. So generate the tags, set up the build environment for uh, uh, build kit, and uh, log into Docker and build the image. This used to be one step before, now it's, what is it, five? <laughs> All right. Eric, I have a question, this is Sheldon. Hey Sheldon. This might, this might be outside the scope and maybe something we can talk about later, um, but I remember you, we talked about that um, dot GitHub or sorry, yeah, dot GitHub uh, repository for the organization. Yeah, and I was curious if if the centralization of like how how you say create an action and you don't copy and paste that YAML everywhere, but you start reusing it these sucks. across multiple yeah. repos. It does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it was not the holy grail that we um, had pinned our hopes on. So uh, what Sheldon is referring to is this, is the .github repository, which is a special repository you can have on GitHub um, to share community health files is what GitHub calls them. So uh, community health files, actually we don't have any in this one because we have our own way of doing that, but uh, that's one thing. The other thing it can do is um, help you distribute your workflows like this lint workflow. The way it works 
is, let's see here if I uh, remember off the top of my head. So I would go to actions here, I'd click new workflow and then the workflows that are in my .github will automatically appear here. So I can choose from them like a menu of GitHub Actions. This is not that helpful for us at the scale that we operate because we have so many freaking uh, repositories, 347 and counting. So our approach for this has been to just centralize our, the, the reusable GitHub Actions, we just centralize in our build harness. We stick them in our templates folder here under GitHub. So here's, here are our kind of uh, rubber stamped um, GitHub Actions that we then copy into other repositories. Um, is that everyone also familiar with that now? There's, uh, there's another use of .github, I believe. I believe it's for individuals. So uh, if I go to Osterman, you will see now um, a little readme here uh, for, on my profile. So this is customizable and anyone can do this uh, by uh, adding a file uh, to your uh, GitHub repository. So I believe it's in, yeah, let's see your quick repository. Eric, I believe that the readme piece requires you to create your own repo that's just the same as your name. I don't think. Ah, uh, you're right. Up, yeah, yeah so it is, it's similar but different. Yeah, so you're right. This is the one for that. So you could just create a repo with your same GitHub username and there, th then this will show up on your profile. Unfortunately, this doesn't work for organizations. I really wanted to have a, I really wanted this for Cloud Posse, of course. So if you go to Cloud Posse, we could have a, um, a page that uh, routes users across all our repos, adds additional context, organizes our repositories in a way that isn't overwhelming like this is. Um, unfortunately, they didn't roll it out for organizations yet. Now, I don't know if it's planned. Anybody know anything about that? All right. Um, so I, I just saw this at AWS Labs uh, the other day. So this is an example. They, they're they using the GitHub folder for uh, community health as well. And you can see kind of like a good way of using it is if you want to have a security policy across your organization, uh, uh, you can uh, put that in the dot GitHub. And then let's see what happens if we go into one of their it might only affect uh, new repos that are created. I'm not sure exactly. Because I don't see the security file here. So, I don't know. It seems like the uh, .github folder is more like a template repository for new repositories maybe when you create them or to source uh, stuff from. Anybody have more context, more, more experience with the .github community folder? One thing that I uh, saw here, what was it the other day? I don't know if I can find it right away. I did notice that um, AWS Labs was using Mergeify, uh, so I thought that was interesting. If you guys haven't seen Mergeify.io, it's kind of cool. It helps you um, centralize and manage merging. Uh, and you can automatically merge things like from Dependabot. And you can view uh, the queue of all the PRs open. All right, so I think that's the end of what I had to talk about for announcements. Any other interesting announcements that I totally missed? Terraform announcements, Kubernetes announcements, DevOps, general announcements. Airport security groups are getting released natively by AWS. The docs yep. just got updated. They don't yet have like, I expect they're gonna have a blog post and a bigger release. Well, say that one more time. I heard, I missed the first part. The per pod security group. Oh, awesome. Yes, no more need for Calico Enterprise thing. <laughs> I, I can't remember the name. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a whole industry about uh, securing 
network traffic between pods. But um, yeah, I'm sure that's going to satisfy uh, the requirements for most people that need some assurances. And I guess this is obviously why every pod has an ENI, and this is why you're limited on the number of pods you can run on hosts and all that other stuff. Cool. All right, so let's see. We have uh, we have two big topics to talk about today that came up uh, last week and uh, have been coming up more regularly that I'd like to get to. Um, before I get to these two, because I think these are going to take us through the rest of the hour, let me just see what um, oops. Let me just see what else has been mentioned in the office hour Slack. If uh, if there's any quick questions, we can help get to. And Good Guys is asking, hey, I'm trying to create a security group with uh, Terraform AWS uh, module security group uh, such and such. And I'm getting the error, one of CIDR blocks, this, this, or this, or this must be set. I just want to know how I can check that the value return from Beanstalk is right. I'm using TFCTL. So yeah, unfortunately I'm not able to help. Uh, we don't use uh, any of the AWS modules. We don't use TFCTL. And I think there is pretty much clear that for some reason or another, one of these fields has not been adequately uh, satisfied in the parameters passed. Um, all of, yeah, all of those, all of those uh, take care of, you know, who the security group gets gets uh, applied to, or maybe that's not the right word, way to word it, but like I could say, you know, okay, anything from this CIDR block is allowed, or okay, only things inside, you know, uh, this other security group is allowed, or only self is allowed, you know, all of those are who's allowed yeah. to get through on whatever port it's defining. And I'm not necessarily sure if this uh, is the right syntax. You can only output the outputs of the root module, right? Unless, did that change in 0 0.13? Um, so this is, uh, this is nesting. And unless the Beanstalk module provides... Okay, so you have a count of uh, Beanstalks here. And then security group ID is one of the outputs of that Beanstalk environment. So I would just make sure that that Beanstalk environment has that output. But I know it's not that helpful, but uh, let us know what you come up with. Uh, Sheldon, you have to. Sorry, go on, Andrew. I, I do kind of hate that you have to pass through outputs. It is tedious. However, they've made it much easier because now you can return module.star. Uh, outputs, right? Um, so you can return all. You, oh, sorry, you can return a module as an output. So therefore, now you can uh, get all the outputs passed out, passed along very easily. That's interesting. Yeah. So if you're composing that. your, if you're if you're creating modules like meta modules or proxy modules that are uh, in, in embedding lots of other Terraform modules in them, uh, you can define an output. For each of those modules, um, and then uh, those will be passed out in the root module. Don't know if I have a off the top of my head. I don't know where we're doing that. Um, I know we started doing it in some of our ECS modules. Uh, it was uh, something getting contributed by one of our community members, RB, I think. But yeah. Uh, all right, so let's see here. Uh, GitHub Actions, any easy way to trigger an action on demand? Kind of sucks. Is the, the, the truth is, no, not really. You can Scroll use GitHub bit. API. Scroll a bit more. There oh. is now a button. That what? Yeah. Oh. They added a button. People yelled at them enough that they added a button. July 6th, manual triggers with workflow dispatch. Mm, interesting. So 
you're saying that if I go to uh, like one of our module, one of our repos with GitHub Actions, uh, where is it only on uh, running uh, P on uh, existing PRs? Oh, no, but it does need to listen to the workflow dispatch event. Oh, okay, interesting. Like it's a new type of event, basically. Oh, nice, nice. That's cool. I will. I'm gonna uh, make sure to share that uh, with our team uh, later. That's cool. And then the other way is uh, using the CLI, uh, or the last way is using uh, repository dispatches, but not, none of those are that good. The, uh, the, the one thing to realize, and I don't know if this works that way, but oftentimes when you're using dispatched events, they run against master but this allows you to change the branch interesting hmm. has anybody uh, worked with this uh, option yet manual triggers with github actions yeah we use it in the helen project oh cool um and uh, any caveats like it don't like uh, do the does this do the does the status API update for the appropriate commit SHA on, on like the branch or PR that you're working on? Well, it's uh, just uh, like a regular workflow execution, just that okay. you can have a prompt for to give uh, like a release version or something. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Let's see here, what else was asked um, by Sheldon? Any update on any dashboard or centralized reporting for actions that have been run in an entire organization? Yeah, I don't think there is anything by GitHub for that yet. Uh, have, have any, has anybody seen a third party uh, like dashboard you can deploy that uses the GitHub API and centralizes or surfaces the build activity across your organization? All right. Uh, David, uh, do you have any? Uh, you haven't seen anything for this either. Uh, no. Hmm. It's 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 actually a deficiency in a lot of uh, CI/CD SaaS uh, right now. Is that they don't provide a great good centralized overview of your build infrastructure and how it's doing. And right, see other questions. Uh, Gitpod did this. Terraform plan on the single dog. By the way, I could uh, maybe come with a shameless uh, plug. Okay, go for it. <laughs> um, so if you have a lot of stuff running on-prem, you might need uh, GitHub uh, runners on-prem as well. Yeah. And they're kind of a hassle to manage. Yeah. So I made a Kubernetes operator, which talks to the GitHub API, so you can spin up. Uh, oh, very cool! Run, runners based on pods. But you, and you're not working with Mumoshu on this, are you? Because Mumoshu no. has something he's been working on. Can you share your uh, pro? Is it's an open source project? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, where uh, is there a chat box here? Maybe. Oh, uh, share. Oh, uh, are you in our uh, sweet ops community? Yeah, uh, which channel do you want? Go to, go to the Office Hours channel. That's the best one to uh, yeah, get it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And we'd, um, we ch yeah, this is the one by Summer Wind, uh, Actions Runner Controller. So that might be interesting for you to take a look at um, uh, since there's a similar project uh, working on something like that. Yeah, I did have a look at that one in okay. the beginning. And also, yeah, it's the Philip stuff. I think that runs on <coughs> EC2 instances. Charlie, no. <laughs> My dog. Sorry, go on. 
Uh, yeah, I did have a look at that back in the time, but I wanted to support the uh, organization scoped uh, runners, which oh, okay. that one didn't support uh, back then. Okay, that is cool. Let's see here. So you shared that link out because I want to check that out later. AWS GitHub runner. Very thorough. Yeah, Philips also has a module for that, but it is in EC2s. It's not oh, okay. a Kubernetes cool. operator. Cool. Nice. That that'll get in, that'll come in handy probably. I'll take that out, check that out. Mm, let's see. Uh, any other uh, plugs or interesting announcements like that? Otherwise, uh, we'll get into the main talking point here. All right. Let's see here. Which way to go? Should we talk about number two or number three? First, let's talk about number two first and uh, go into three. So, this stems from um, a, a a point brought up uh, last week. Here, uh, Vlad um, Vlad emphasized. I think it was uh, actually Sheldon that first brought it up here. Perhaps. Um, let me see here how I should summarize this. All right. Let me uh, let me do my own little quick narrative, and then uh, uh, Vlad or Sheldon, you can jump in uh, to make sure I captured everything. So, in Terraform, uh, there's been a lot of uh, hard lessons learned over the years, and in the beginning with Terraform, uh, everyone created like one workspace uh, or project and had all your Terraform code in there for all of your environments. And that worked really well in the pilot POC phase, and you had um, you know, just you know a few small like auto scaling groups and a bastion host and an RDS instance, and then you duplicated that for a couple things. And then the environment grew and grew and grew and grew, and your your plan started taking 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. And uh, you start having more problems maybe with, with some kinds of operations that you were doing. Like it would work in one environment and then when you went to go run it in prod, it would uh, error for a different reason. And the blast radius was just massive. Like you could accidentally tear down the production database uh, by setting a flag incorrectly or something. So. This evolved and we, we realized that maybe it's better to optimize for day two operations rather than day zero operations. So day zero operations is like, I need to bring up a complete environment for our, uh, for our product, uh, for dev, prod, staging, QA, etc. To now, well, really I want to be able to work in dev very, um, uh, very safely in a, in a protected uh manner that could never impact the other environments at the same time. So what we did is we broke, uh, the first thing we did is we broke apart all of our Terraform projects by environment or account or stage or however you term it. And then that was still not enough that we decomposed that. So like maybe your RDS um, instances are their own project or workspace or your EKS clusters are their own project or workspace. And the nice thing here is that when you make changes to the EKS workspace, it can only affect that workspace. Um, and you, you get a plan and apply very quickly on that usually because the scope is heavily reduced. And this has worked very well uh, where you have kind of a small set of environments. Let's say you have less than maybe 10 environments. Uh, you have maybe less than 10 projects in each one of those environments. But what happens then is this new problem where what if you are like an enterprise SaaS company and your customers require that you have a dedicated AWS account and full stack for you. So your normal SaaS offering is $1,000 a month, but hey, they're going to pay you, you know, 60000 a month for this offering. You're probably going to take it, right? There's a right price for it at some point. 
Now suddenly you're managing maybe a hundred different environments, each with 10 or 20 or 30 little projects in there, and the scope is unmanageable. You can't plan or apply all that. It, it, and, and you have to figure out the DAG, the graph between, well, when this little workspace updates, that means these two other workspaces need to update. Um, and we're almost reinventing what Terraform was designed to do, which was figure out like the dependencies between these resources and when one thing changes, how to update it. So I feel like uh, this is something that we've come full circle on. Uh, it's something that we cut, we face all the time at Cloud Posse as we work with a lot of enterprise-oriented companies. So we are uh, we're, we have I, I wouldn't say we have cracked the nut on this, and we have invested a lot of time and effort in doing it uh, with uh, decomposed projects and workspaces. But all that work has made me think about maybe we should go back to. Uh, the monolithic root module that brings up our complete environment and offload that complexity to Terraform, what it was designed to do. So that's my narrative on it. Any other things uh, that, Andrew, you'd like to add to that, Vlad or Sheldon? I would say uh, in, in terms of what you're discussing, the composition of the, of the project layout and everything is slightly different than the administration of the workspaces. I think that's two separate issues. Uh, the, comp the composition, even with a root module, if you're, if you're trying to reduce the blast radius, it's still gonna have in say Terraform Cloud, each one of those could have its own, you could have you know 100 different workspaces still. Yeah. So that, that, the composition and then the management of cloud-based workspaces, I feel is like two separate issues. I, it can tie together, but still separate issues. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. And then, and then, okay. So, uh, exactly. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. Let me um, uh, give my spin on that. So, so what I described here is then, so we have this decomposition of workspaces um, and, it, and it might lead to that you have, you know, hundreds or thousands of workspaces. And this is obviously beyond the scope of what you can manage man manually. And if you're using something like Terraform cloud and Terraform cloud, uh, you need one workspace per environment, more or less, uh, depending on how you organize things. But if we want to reduce this blast radius, you have a production environment for our API service. That is one workspace. If you have a QA environment in the QA account for the API, that is one workspace. So managing that programmatically uh, with Terraform Cloud uh, is probably uh, the only feasible way. What is uh, the so so? Here's what I want to open this up to to get uh, you know some some feedback on like how you're doing it. If if anybody else is managing uh, like dedicated customer environments on AWS using Terraform, are you using the monolithic module approach or are you using lots of individual projects all combined together with a tool like Terragrunt or Terraform Cloud or your own invoke build scripts or something like that? Um, what what tools are you using to support uh, that use case? Uh, Andrew, why don't you start with uh, what you're doing because you were working on something similar to this uh, and had some recent victories on it. I, I'm so I think I'm working on a, a different layer of what, than what you're talking about. I, I'm working on a module. Um, but you know, I don't care about workspaces. Like you know. Well, okay. So I, I just, yeah, there's there's some overloaded language here, uh, and it, it's because we all use Terraform slightly differently. So, for us, we we have projects. Uh, like I don't know. Let me see if I have a, a quick example I can show here. Cloud Posse infrastructure, or let let me go to I, Terraform root modules instead. So for us, for at Cloud Posse. Now, these, these root modules are not what we're currently using in most of our engagements, but I'm bringing this up as an example of how things could be de decomposed. So we would decompose ECR to a separate project, ECS to a separate project, EKS to a separate project, uh, CIS, all of these are root modules. But then you invoke them any number of times for any number of environments that you need. 
what you've done, Andrew, is you've combined a whole number of these. You've combined EKS with Helm files, with ECR, with other things into one mega module that brings it all up in one plan and apply, right? Yeah. The, the point of mine, though, is a repeatable solution. So, you know, I would compare mine to, like, the Cloud Posse, you know, EKS cluster module or, you Got know, it. that node group module that you just showed or whatever. Um, you know, the, the the discussion we were having earlier was, you know, what do you what do you put in that module? You know, like, your EKS module does not have, like, its node groups and stuff. You know, it, it – you, that's split out into another module. And so the discussion is, what do you put in this module? And for yeah. me, it's come down to, um, you know, usability. And, yeah. you know, what am I targeting? Like, am I targeting, you know, a, 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 a Terraform beginner who, you know, doesn't have a lot of experience with Terraform and I'm trying to give them kind of a turnkey way to create one of these Kubernetes clusters or whatever that we're, that we're, you know, creating, or am I going to, you know, turn it into a bunch of little Lego blocks that, uh, that, you know, that then has an instruction booklet on how to fit them all together. Like, you know, the EKS module plus the node groups module, you know, yeah. the, the, the way I'm targeting right now is a module that contains the EKS module and the node groups module so that yeah. you can use one thing and you get the whole stack. Which is what we do too. Uh, so in our customer engagements, what we deliver to the customer is a module that combines the other modules, but we yeah. still keep it pretty small. And but we and we wouldn't, for example, deploy any of the Helm releases or Helm files in that module. We do that in a separate one. But and and this is not a critique. This is just like a uh, um, pointing out like where do you draw the line? Like you said, like so in your module, you're combining also the deployment of those charts with your module. Um, yeah. uh, should one you know where does one draw the line? Does one include the VPC into that? Does and then the subnets is that you know do we create a module that has VPCs subnets the cluster the node groups and the charts deployed? Uh, so how much do we pack into this module? Uh, oh yeah, Eric Berg, you're doing something like this uh, as well, right? Uh, where you have a one module composed of lots of other modules that brings up a complete environment. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> I inherited pretty much one huge monolithic module and I've done some breaking it apart into sub modules but even even the other day I got a it wasn't even a PR I was like noticed the push and I'm like you're like just dumping resources into this root module instead of you know more sub modules that we can manage but yes one big module that we run multiple times this spins up the entire environment for each client environment so this did a UAT. We've got our first customer coming online. That'll yeah. be yeah, run that same thing. So, um, I, how long is it taking you to do uh, a, like a plan and apply uh, of your mega module? That, you know, I just did a spun up a new environment, so got it from the very beginning. It was not that bad. One, mm -hmm. you know, you start looking for. I started really grasping for straws. I was not a super experienced Terraform guy when I got this, but things like um, first I pulled out the cloud formation or cloud front distributions, but then I realized that you could just restrict the cloud formation distribution to just US, Canada, and Europe instead of having them spread over all over the world, which was costing me hours in terms of like a full life cycle of oh doing yeah 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 because they're so slow to modify yeah yeah but now it's actually super solid um and i just have to figure out how to continue to pull stuff apart for yeah. all the obvious reasons and how to how to set up a culture a procedure where people aren't just like dumping crap wherever they want but you know yeah. To how to add a new service or something like that. So, uh, Vlad, what, uh, I, I really want to hear from you because uh, this seems like something you've dealt with as well or thought about. Yeah. Um, so, I do love Kubernetes. My biggest 
uh, runs had issues because they were taking longer than an hour, which was not playing nice with the token that Atlantis was using to uh, mm. authenticate and stuff. Very I cool. don't like having one big fat module that uh limits lim that has very very uh, small blast radius like i've broken terraform state in the past not often but it happens if everything is part of one module you cannot ever delete or have like fundamental changes to that module which is absolutely terrifying and is gonna add more and more issues as your architecture and team evolve yeah what I usually like doing is having a template GitHub repo or GitHub folder. I don't really use Terraform where spaces I use folders and trunk based development, but having a folder that is basically the template and that has a bunch of modules in, but it is its own like Terraform workspace. Yeah. And want to create a new module, oh, sorry, want to create a new environment. Awesome. Copy that modify whatever you want to modify in there. Usually there are some you know, helpful comments, the same defaults that are even um, more in depth than the default module, uh, yeah. module values and so on and so forth. And it's been working well, but, and now I'm going to get into the second point of uh, the larger topic. I'm doing this at a kind of low scale. I mean, I'm not, usually working above 30 to 50 workspaces like that's not my area if i go into that uh, space usually i'm working with SaaS companies that know they okay we are definitely gonna need uh dynamic environment provisioning for customers like customer signs up in 10 minutes we've gotta have an environment ready for them we cannot wait we're not going to do onboarding with an engineer that's going to create a new PR and so on and so forth. And at that level, it's all done programmatically. I don't think I've ever seen it done with Terraform, which is weird. Terraform um, Enterprise supports this, right? Like you can do applies and stuff with by calling an API. Yeah, it, it, there you can call you can trigger uh, workflows to run uh, via the API. You can integrate okay, those so webhooks so from other things. Um, yeah, uh, I know the <coughs> sorry, the AWS suspect tree you know, has a bunch of talks and templates and examples on GitHub about how to do this with uh, CloudFormation. AWS, what was that? AWS SaaS Factory? Oh, I'm not familiar with SaaS yeah. Factory. It's a team inside, uh, well, a program team inside AWS that uh, helps AWS partners build SaaS huh. solutions that run on AWS. Basically, like super high level and very specialized solution architects that come in and work with your company to do a better SaaS on AWS. And they have a lot of repos and talks, including at reInvent, that include uh, stuff like, okay, how do we do this? And being AWS, they are usually based on their model of, yeah, we submit the uh, well, CloudFormation stack, step functions, yeah. all that jazz that they're also using internally for the EKS control plane and so on and so forth. I've started, uh, an example recently let me see if i can find it but yeah low scale uh, a template repo or a template folder uh, high scale it's all done through code i'm yeah. <laughs> not doing anything by hand so sheldon um i know you're dealing with what you're dealing with this problem of uh, the sprawl of the number of workspaces you have right and uh, were you using, I forget, you were using Terraform Cloud for that or not? Partially. Uh, the challenge I've had with this is that we don't have, uh, a, say, a root module repo. As I've kind of learned and moved through my Terraform journey, I've tended to spin up a, a, a Git repo specifically for uh, a, a one purpose, like, say, server accounts and then you know create a repo for that tied into the CI CD with github uh, actions yeah. and Terraform cloud 
Um, I'm, I'm up for actually doing more of a root module and I feel I'd get more contributions from folks, but because there was no standardization, I haven't approached that. Uh, my mo yeah. my workspace count is at, is at 64, so it's not at a high scale compared to some, but for me, what I'm, what I'm discovering is that if, if you're in the free tier, the challenge I have is that if you're in a free tier, there's no real level of permissions. So if, yeah. if you want to enforce workspace creation through code and have that in a standardized approach, the only way to achieve that, I feel, is to actually make it where only the service account can actually create the workspaces and you have to do it through pull requests if you don't do that then anybody can do it through the cli that has access yeah and as a result your your workspaces are going to be managed individually you're not, not going to have them standardized i would say that the free tier is good for prototyping stuff in general but probably not the the way to run it uh longer term but yeah you're right yeah. uh pull pull request driven workflow uh to manage the terraform cloud workspaces would be the most secure way there um if only terraform cloud didn't have such a uh uh a crazy pricing jump uh it, it, I've got some, yeah i've got some approval approval for this next year that i put in but even even on that when i looked at the enterprise uh, I had some feedback from some folks and it was even more than I thought, like exponentially more. So <laughs> that's going to be the challenge in adoption. I think with Terraform cloud is just incrementally add a little bit of value with maybe buying a parallel runner or one feature. Um, but right now I think it jumps up to 20, then to 70 and then much higher. Uh, it's not something you can just dip your toes in to, to try it as much. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we're working with right now, and this is just a very small example, and I can't run through it uh, uh, for the call, but it's just how we're able to define then the, the workspaces in Terraform Cloud in a single config.yaml. So here are all the environments. So th this is uh, called global, is this one. Uh, this one here is called ops genie. The global environment is just like settings uh, shared for uh, everything then the ops genie environment and uh, this team policy auto close. So this is, uh, so this workspace here is controlled by Terraform code to, to manage Terraform workspaces uh, with Terraform. So we have, this is a, this, this repo is actually still private. Uh, it'll probably remain that way, but we're going to be open sourcing some of the stuff, but managing, teams, members, and workspaces all using a, a single YAML configuration file. Um, so this is our approach to saying, you know, so the question was, you know, how, how can you manage, you know, thousand, hundreds or thousands of workspaces? These are workspaces that are created programmatically automat uh, um, ultimately. And the, the way to do that is with a, uh, is with Terraform code that you define your own schema for what YAML represents your product environment, and then you have the Terraform Cloud go and make it so. So for, for this particular use case, this was the YAML that we came up with that made sense for us, but this is evolving. We have some better stuff coming out. Um, this is a little bit of a lab environment you could say for us right now. global variables that we can then extend. All right, um, let's see, did we, so the, the, the related question here is that, you know, so if I'm to recap kind of what we've heard uh, folks talk about is um, there's a balance between how big your root modules are, and how many you break it your your infrastructure into, how many modules it's composed of. Uh, you can go the extreme route where it's all in one module, and then uh, you have this scary blast radius um, that you know Eric talked about uh, will cause scaling problems down the road as you have th as the number of team members contributing to it the risk increases that somebody will make a mistake and you have to have really good oversight on the pull requests and reviewing the plans to make sure nothing happens. 
And then you have the other side where you have lots of really small projects. Um, each one uh, has their own life cycle. In the latter, we have this problem of loosely decoupled Terraform workspaces. And I, I know I'm going back and forth on what workspaces mean, and that's because there's confusion. Like there's Terraform Cloud defines workspace one way, and Terraform Open Source defines workspace some other way. For me, it's just this. The for me, it's just uh, uh, a set of resources that share the same life cycle um, and the share share the same TF state file. Uh, so. When you're handling, when you have all these decoupled workspaces, for those of you doing that, how are you handling propagation of changes? So, when you're using a remote state, workspace B depends on the out, depends on a remote state output of workspace A. Workspace A changes. Now you need to know that workspace B needs to be reapplied. Uh, I know, uh, you know. So, the common approaches are like Terragrunt, um, and then with Terraform Cloud, the approach would be with triggers. So basically, Project B can subscribe to updates from Project A, and when A changes, it triggers B to run. How is everyone else uh, handling these coupled Terraform states? Handle it through orchestration. Orchestrate. You have workflows, and you have to. You kind of have to be rigorous about that. It's unfortunately a side effect of having all these decoupled states. Yeah. But is it naive to? Sorry, going in. Is it naive to to? Is it is the thought that one workspace, depending on the state of another workspace, is is something to avoid? What the, the alternative is you end up having to then copy pasta a lot of settings that were output here into the config of the other workspace. So I mean, you, I don't think you can avoid, in decoupling these projects, I don't think you can avoid that there will be coupling. It obviously yeah. depends where you draw that line. But for example, <laughs> like if you have one project that creates your VPCs and subnets, how do you pass those to the EKS module? Okay, so we're not going to do that. We're going to combine VPC subnets and EKS so we don't have that problem. Okay, so now you're going to have things that uh, a separate workspace that deploys your apps to the EKS cluster. Okay, how do they get the EKS cluster endpoint? How do they get the uh, you know uh, the cube CT, uh, the cube config for it? Well, all right. yeah. we'll combine all of that, and then it's like uh, what, yeah. uh, there has to be some knowledge transfer between these projects. I think. I think, and I think we're talking about different scales too. Like in, in your example, you've got the same team doing all that stuff. In mine, I don't. Uh, my team, you know, I receive a VPC and subnet laydown. They give me the IDs of the VPC and the subnets, and I am not able to control them. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. Very good point. Very fair point. So they're just in my TFRs file, right? Yeah. <clears throat> It does go though, there is always coupling with this, whether it's another team doing it or not. Like if they, God, God help that they would never actually change any of that on you or anything. But at some point, if somebody changes something, it always is coupled. You, it, whether it's in Terraform remote state or in FSM or through a data source, there is- Or always, JIRA. <laughs> through anything. Can you? It's coupled. Can can you make it so that I guess you could uh, using what IAM roles for an S3 bucket? You could make it so that a Terraform remote state is read only. Yeah. Yeah, I will mention Terraform. that would be that would be nice. My people don't do that. They're there not can be a lot of stuff <laughs> that you don't want though, like your like your uh, master RDS credentials could be in there. For you. Yeah. I will say Terraform 13 makes it a little bit nicer. Whenever you run a plan now, it gives you the outputs. If the outputs change, it shows you during the plan step. Mm. Instead of having to run an apply in order to see your outputs change. Optimistically, probably. Like, there's a lot of outputs that it can't compute probably until it runs, but 
it doesn't. Well, it will. It will have, I think, the same caveat as other stuff. But it yeah. definitely will basically say, "Hey, I'm going to have to recalculate this output or something." It's pretty good so far. Yeah. Is version thirteen's bug fixed? Where somebody indicated you were supposed to be able to iterate over a provider now too? I haven't checked further into that. They know of it. I, so we brought that up last week. Uh, in that week, we haven't checked back to see if it's been fixed or not. My guess is that unless there's a new uh, point release, a patch release for 0 0.13 since last uh, last Wednesday, my guess is not. Let's find out. Keep talking, though, everyone. Don't wait for me. I tried to adopt the, the version 13. And it kept airing out on me with um, uh, saying it was a Terraform bug on 13.0 where I couldn't uh, find the local version of the module. So I haven't really used it much more. Yeah, so this, uh, and this was the one released last Wednesday. So it hasn't been fixed uh, yet. Basically, you can't iterate over any module that depends on a provider like AWS provider. What if you explicitly passed in the modules using the prov or the providers using the providers block? Uh, no, so we we pass in the providers block, but there, I forget what it is, what the exact error message right. is. But yeah, it's it, it throws an error that it can't find the provider for that index or something. So it's like you you need to be able to provide an indexed list of providers or something. Uh, or, or if not indexed, then it should be like just use always the default one for all of them. But I, I don't know why. Uh, I, I don't know the fundamental problem. Cool. Uh, any other uh, interesting observations related to this coupled or decoupled Terraform state and how to manage workflows? across projects. I think this also bleeds into the, how do you propagate changes from one environment to the other? Yeah, it's another way of saying the same thing, yeah. yeah. That is, so how to propagate changes in Terraform. All right, well, that pretty much brings us then to the end of the hour for today. Thank you everyone for uh, participating in the conversation. Uh, I think we, we definitely got to the, the meat of uh, the problem here uh, with some of the Terraform things. Um, and what was that cool thing you just, uh, we, we, we learned about the, um, the operator for running Terraform runners in Kubernetes uh, by David, that was cool. And uh, the AWS SaaS, um, what was that, what was that called? SAS Glad Factory. SAS Factory. That's something I got to look into. And there was one other thing I just don't remember. But tune back to the rest of the podcast to, to listen to that. Anyways, uh, talk to everyone uh, same time, same place next week. Uh, if you'd like to have a conversation with Cloud Posse directly, you can always go to cloudposse.com slash quiz. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz uh, to talk with me. And uh, we'll see if we can help you with your problems. With that said, talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.